Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go comedy. It's now time for Let's Just Say. Please welcome your host, Patty Like, I love you guys, you're the best man ever. I'm gonna 
play, you're going to come to our hometown, you're going to play it. A party we're going to have, and it's going to be, I love you guys. We get, I made a bunch of copies of your tapes. And it's tapes. <laughs> and, um, and it's like, thanks, we make money off of those. But anyway, so like, we figure it's just going to be some party with like two other big beefy dudes with <laughs> arms, sleeves. No, we get to this party, and it was at a VFW hall, like, like there, you know, like the middle of nowhere, like cornfields and cows everywhere. And we're going, and we're thinking it's going to be two dudes. We get to this VFW hall with a huge lawn. Packed. Every square inch is a big beefy dude with arm sleeve, arm sleeve tattoos and a backward baseball hat. Packed. There were hundreds of people there. And we pull our van up to the driveway and with military like precision, the crowd parts. Drive down, van, drive, park, door opens, beefy dudes come up, grab our gear. I've never been robbed. <laughs> it wasn't so bad. It wasn't as bad as I expected. I was thinking like, okay, we're not, I'm not getting hit. They're, they're not talking to us, but it's it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's fine. And they got every guitar pick, every drumstick. The boondog comes out and he's like, oh my god, you guys, I love you guys. And you're going to go on after this band that's coming up next. And you're going to play. And you're gonna and it's like, yeah. Yeah, we're going to play on our equipment that we still own. And it's... It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Now, yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's yeah, gonna be great. Blue Dog was like, yeah, yeah, come on, guys, we're gonna go smoke a bowl. And it's like, yeah, cool. All right. So I don't smoke weed. So I'm like, I'm gonna go out to the venue and I'm gonna check out this band that's coming out before us and just get a feel for the room. And so I go out and the other guys are going back and they're smoking a bowl. And I'm like, looking around and this other band's getting ready to go. And and like little warning bells are starting to go off in the back of my head. It's like something's wrong in this BFW hall that's like shoulder to shoulder, big beefy dudes with arm, arm sleeves and backwards baseball caps. And it's like looking around, and this band takes the stage. I'm looking around, and like everybody in the crowd has like combat boots on. Nobody has hair. And this dude's like, let me tell you about this dum dum who stole my job. Except like he didn't say dum dum, he said like a bad word, like, like the worst. Word. And I'm looking around, I'm like, oh no, like there's a there's a lot of swastikas in this room that are running the back. And I'm like, guys, 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 and they're like, yeah, yeah, we figured it out too. We're playing a white pride rally, so no, so it was the worst. So yeah, I did what anybody here would have done, of course. I went out and I lectured them on the you know <laughs> we we played and, and they had a good time. I wish I would have been brave enough, but anyway, so like I don't know, I wish, there was, I wish there was the moral of the story. A wise person once told me that uh, hatred is a lack of imagination and discourse is the enemy. And Boondoggle and I are still friends on Facebook. <laughs> he hung up his guitar a long time ago as well. And he's got a bunch of kids. And, uh, he has very strong feelings about the current administration, too. So, <laughs> and sometimes I, I feel like we can have a reasonable discourse and I help nudge him in, in a direction of imagination. So, anyways. Well, that's my story. Thanks for seeing me.
And uh, so I started looking for a job. I went online, Indeed, if anybody is looking, it's actually pretty good. I found a lot of shit on Indeed. And I mean shit. Um, the, first job, <laughs> the first job that I found, it was like, okay, so you walk in and there's this really pretty, pretty woman. She's at the front desk, all dressed up. And there's a pool table that flips over to a ping pong table. And there's art on the walls. And you're like, okay, this place is badass. This is pretty cool. I gotta work here. And you get into the interview and they start to talk about your qualifications. And once they made me feel like I was qualified, they dropped the, and we take company business trip to the Bahamas. <laughs> and that, I'm just like, oh yeah, I gotta go. Oh my god. So we're super excited. Mom, Dad, I'm going to be an adult, I've got this, I'm going to do this job, and no benefits or anything like that. But I'm getting paid higher in the Bahamas, come on. So, I get on board, and a couple weeks go by, and I realize, like, people are dropping like flies. There's, like, 15 to 25 interviews in the lobby a day, and I'm not allowed to mention certain things like inside sales, outside sales, marketing. Turns out it's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> so I learned, and I went and found a big girl job that actually offered the 401k that I had talked about, the PTO, the benefits, all of the good things that I thought, I'm doing it, I'm moving forward, and I'm a big girl. I'm a big girl. I've got this. So I get in, and having a corporate job was actually pretty cool at first. I got like a month and a half's worth of training all paid, was making almost $20 an hour, no degree. I was like, I've got this world, watch out, the Shelby Drake is coming. And I'm doing all these trainings and I'm all excited. And then I start to think, well, maybe I can make a difference here in this corporate environment. So I started an employee relations committee, and started paying all these parties. We were, I was all passionate, trying to like, we were doing exercise things, like, okay, everybody, let's stretch, let's do this. You're sitting at a desk all day, you cannot be sore. Don't break your neck, don't break your back. You've got this. And I was preaching all this stuff that they wanted some younger person to preach so that everyone would like jump on board. But I didn't realize it. So I was sitting in a meeting and the slide came across the screen that said 20% of the people do 80% of the work. <laughs> I looked around and was like, you fucking assholes. I do 80% of the work. You guys do nothing. And I've got my people up here that are like, you guys fucking rock because we are carrying this place, this corporation. We are the heart and the soul. And I realized I couldn't do it. So I went from this art job to completely flipping over doing a corporate job, busting my ass, doing all these great things. And realized that this huge turn, this change of faith, this change of direction, was actually wrong. In all this chase for money and all this searching for money, I was thinking I was going to be happier and I might have been more stable. I could go out and discover a place like this, which is fantastic. Going out is great, but I've never been as happy as when I got up, I quit that job, and I cried like a baby. I will not lie. <laughs> I cried, I was like, okay, I gotta go, guys, I'm so sorry. But, but I left, and I have never felt happier in my life, guys. I cannot tell you that you make this change, you make this decision, and sometimes it's for the better. And I hope that you guys all find some value in my story. Go find some happiness for each and every one of you. But it's not fucking money. <laughs>
college, and I did like you know five years in Japan. Then I come to the period where I move back, and I'm in Nashville, and that's just before I moved up here. And I lived in Nashville for about four and a half years. Um, when I think about living in Nashville, there's a few big things that come to mind. Uh, let's see. In year one, I got married, and then my wife, who was Japanese, went back to Japan, but then couldn't come back because her visa wasn't proper. Something about a travel pass that she didn't have, so she was stuck in Japan. Uh, so during the time that I'm fighting a woman, I win that battle. Uh, I got a good friend of mine from college passed away. Got the wife back shortly after that, in year two. Different person. People change about a year. And people change. So she turned into a bitch. <laughs> I'm a little bitter. I'm a little bitter. It's okay. <laughs> bitter goes good with some shit like bitter. <laughs> so we got divorced. Uh, year three, childhood friend passed away. And then uh, year four, my. We always had, our family always had weird, didn't know what it would say. Step grandfather? Uh, father of my grandmother? Uh, regardless, hell of a man. I uh, married my grandmother for 15 years. He passed away a week and a half later. My father passed away. So yeah, it's raining shit on Alex during this four-year period, right? And here's the weird thing. Like this whole time, I, you know, I was kind of doing the boo-boo face. Sorry for me. And my best advice, well, to give anybody, I guess, is don't ever get that face because no one. It's going to feel sorry for you and only fix your life with yourself. But I was trying to figure out why. Why is it just feel like mom is always bad luck, bad luck since I moved back? And then at dad's funeral, uh, which was a hell of an event, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's very sad. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. I'm over it. It's all right. Y'all get it. Okay. <laughs> it was like, he's the same way as I was. We wanted to be fucking funny, like a big party, right? Which it was. Jesus. There was an open bar and it got robbed. Um, <laughs> and if it wasn't free, it had been a robbery. <laughs> Hell of a party. And at the event, like, even we got the preacher involved in too, like, we all told funny stories. For example, my sister, who was a doctor, told the story about how when she got her white coat, you know, the white coat ceremony, when you're coming to the doctor, they give you the white coat. They say, what a great person you are, how amazing you are, the amazing things you've done to your life, you're going to do to society. So as we're leaving, with all the other parents and all the other future doctors with all the bright, shiny white coats, my dad's in the car, and George is posing with, for a picture with a friend. And my dad yells across the parking lot, hey, George, before you go get the big head, remember, the guy who cuts my hair every other Saturday, he wears a white coat, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that made my day. Um, and I get up after my sister and tell her a funny series of like isms that he used to say, because apparently we have the exact same voice. I used to answer the phone. People would think I was him and start telling me things I should not fucking do. Mm. This is posted for he this is when he was dating, his dating period. It was a lot of a lot of nasty bad um, Anywho, during this period of time when I'm up there talking, you know, <coughs> people are just dying laughing. Like one guy literally fell out of the fucking pew. Which I thought was pretty awesome. And you know, it's at the after party when everybody was just, you know, filling up on liquor. Uh, that I kinda of started thinking about it and I was like, you know. That moment when I was talking, like, I was fucking happy. And like, this is like, should be, I should not be doing this way at a funeral, right? Especially for my own father. But like, it was a moment of like pure, right here, right now, I'm having a great time. And I started thinking about that, and I was like, well, you know, I like doing this. And then I thought about the other periods of my life, like high school, I had hobbies. I did football and the student council where you don't really do anything, you just show up and they say, you're on the student council. You know, you know, and then, like, you know, and then in college, you know, did things with the fraternity, did things with, like, the university events and stuff. Uh, did a little bit of drama here and there. Uh, in Japan, I taught English, which was my job, but that's kind of a performance. 
And then I had to pretend like I like these kids. I like, hey, 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 cool. Uh, oh, shit. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then my, my hobbies were like hosting parties and like uh, being the hype man for a Japanese heavy metal band. <laughs> Instinctive bit there, but that your books, check it out there. So it's quite bad out, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. And then, then I started thinking about the years in Nashville and where I realized that I had only been, you know, working and then maybe going out on the weekends occasionally with my friends and getting drunk, which was fun at times. But, you know, it's, there wasn't anything deeper than that. I wasn't doing anything to entertain myself. So basically, I kind of came to the conclusion that well, I gotta start doing something. Jesus. So I started doing stand up a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say stand up comedy because nobody fucking laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if y'all had done this when I was doing that, I'd probably still be doing that. <laughs> it was like fucking crickets. Um, and I got the people just left. <laughs> but I was having fun because I enjoyed having the mic. Like I do right now. I, I enjoy this I, and I don't mind it. And then, um, shortly thereafter, I was like, you know, that kind of moved me to like get a new job, move up here, and then all, I mean, inevitably join Go Comedy. We do the courses here, which are fucking amazing. And everybody's doing those, and you can try them out. Um, I love this place and love what they do here. Uh, so I guess the about face was just like realizing that one moment that life is difficult, right? It's not going to be easy. And bad things that are outside of your control are going to continuously happen. And they will define periods of your life. Unless you're making life as awesome for you as you possibly can be. Because if you're not doing shit and then something bad happens, the only thing you're going to remember is that shitty thing that happened to you, right? <laughs> but if you're doing a bunch of badass shit like going to WrestleMania or getting on this damn stage right here and telling a story, Maybe, just maybe, you know, those bad things don't seem so bad. Right? So y'all make me all happy. Thank y'all very much. Ourselves, we started drinking and talking and having a good time. 
and she was mentioning that a couple of her friends were supposed to show up a little bit later, whatever. We order our dinner, and as our dinner is arriving, a group of men walk in, and I look at Nicole, and I watch her zero in on one of them, and decide he was the one. <laughs> and I was like, here we go. <laughs> so uh, we're sitting at the table, and the server comes up, and she starts to call off the food that she's got to see who's is who's. And I yelled, that one's so-and-so, that one's mine. I'm loud, I'm loud, human in general. And one of the guys that showed up decided that he needed to tell me to be quiet like a church mouse. That didn't blow over very well. So I laid into him, the whole table was silent, nobody knew each other. Very awkward, but we got through it. Gin, tequila for the win, am I right? Makes everything better. Um, we continued to talk, he continued to feel like he needed to apologize to me, and I was like, don't even, no, I gave you a chance, you're done. In the meantime, Nicole's chatting it up with one of these caramel fellows, really enjoying her time with him, and I was talking to a guy that was sitting next to her, and I was talking over her. So once she was done eating, she goes, would you like to fucking move closer to him? And I was like, probably. <laughs> She went to the bathroom, we exchanged seats, she came back, and she ended up sitting next to the man that she made fuck eyes at. <laughs> and I was like, get it, girl. We finished up dinner, we decided it was time to go to a new bar. So we end up leaving that bar after we figured out our tab, and we walked to the next place. And I sort of watched everybody kind of start to press, uh, pair up. And uh, one of my co-worker friends showed up <laughs> and she had just come from a wedding so she had tennis shoes and a really fancy dress on and I was like oh my friend's here I'm gonna talk to her and hang out and I'll in the meantime watch Nicole kind of latch down to the sky and I'm thinking she's gonna take him home tonight this is excellent thus the home man's chronicles and uh, we get to the bar we start talking uh, we end up finding a place to sit we end up <laughs> being able to order drinks, I'm listening to them chit chat, and I'm figuring, wow, this is actually really going to work out. Meantime, I made up with the guy I yelled at before because it wasn't worth it. Yeah. So that was my about face. It was like giving him a second chance. He was still a terrible person. It didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I it, but I did. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the guy that Nicole's talking to was like, well, See you guys later, and he completely did. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, he's coming home tonight. He's gonna be the one. Nope. He completely disappeared on us, and we had no idea where he went. I find out later that they had gone to the Santa crawl. Apparently, there was the Santa crawl, pub yeah. crawl, whatever, yeah. downtown yeah. Marlow. And uh, they had been drinking all day, and he disappeared for a little bit so that he could go barf, <laughs> go to a different bar, take a shot, and then make it back. So I'm not sure if he needed to leave because he wasn't feeling well, but he left and left Nicole high and dry. That's where my part of the story ends. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to expand my social circle. And so I thought, well, I'd make my therapist really 
really happy because she's tired of hearing me complain about dating in your 30s. And so, I mean, dating's hardest. Just putting it out there. I don't know if you know this, but um, you know, she mentioned that I may have zeroed in on this guy. That could be true or false. I mean, it's true. It's, it's possible. It's possible. Um, sometimes, you know, you get thirsty, a little thirsty AF, and uh, you see something that you like, and you're just like, you know what? Tonight's the night. And I, I will mention, though, that this guy was um, almost 10 years younger than me, and so I was like, I can't take him seriously. And then I found out that, yeah, he had been like pup crawling all day, went and barfed and whatever. And so it did change my opinion slightly, but I still was a little bummed that he just like left. Didn't even ask for like my phone number or anything. We were playing games at um, the second bar at the table. And so there were four of us actually kind of all interacting together. I was like, man, we're having a surprisingly good time. My therapist is going to be so proud. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so then uh, we were like, OK, it's about 12, 1230. Either this is when you decide, I'm going to go home, or we're in it to win it. We were in it to win it, and that is our normal go-to. Um, hence why we have a podcast where we tell stories about it, because that's like every time. So we left that bar, and we're walking to another bar. We had another friend pop up. Just met him on the sidewalk, you know? And we're all standing in line. So we actually went back to the original restaurant, but then had to go downstairs into the actual bar. So now we're waiting in line with these dudes who were like in their mid to late 20s. And, you know, I'm in my mid 30s, and I'm waiting in line to go to a basement bar. But that didn't change my tone for the evening. I, um, I was like, man, OK, well, what are we going to do? And then this is where the about face moment happened. One of the other gentlemen who had been part of the dinner party, who had shown up, uh, stood next to me in line. And pretty much as soon as he spoke, I was like, oh, OK, you're it. You're it now. And um, just to describe him very quickly, he's probably, I don't know, 6'3". Um, he's from Arkansas, but he spent time in Australia, so he had this weird twang. And um, he had cowboy boots on. And so we'll refer to him as Cowboy Casanova from here on out. Him and I uh, have a connection, if you will. And then go down into the bar. We <laughs> finally made it downstairs. And we were like, oh, wow, we both like gin. So he ordered 700 gin and tonics with the worst gin possible. And I had been drinking tequila up until that point. And then we we're all hanging out of our jackets because it's winter. And he's like, well, what should we do? And I said, I don't know. There's a booth over there. He goes and rents a VIP booth. And so we're like, OK, huh? And we go in there, hang out. And then everybody's like searching for waters, but they're all gin and tonics. <laughs> so we're like, oh, man, we're going to be hammered. And then he orders a bottle of champagne because I was just like, yeah, let's do it. And then I found out later that all the dudes were also taking ecstasy. <laughs> it was a lot. I know. Yeah. It was a lot. But it was such a great time. And so we're dancing, sweating. He's, you know, speaking to me in his swinging accent. And then this other guy walks up who I had matched with on an app previously. And he kept asking me out. I kept turning him down. And he, like, made eyes with me and then texted me while I was standing there with Cowboy. And um, so I didn't obviously respond. Uh, and then at one point, I ducked away. And it was, like, 2 AM. And I was like, I'm here with somebody else. <laughs> is that really true? That's why I'm not sure. Um, at that point, when the bar was closing down, we decided, this party's not over. We got to go back to my house. We all pile into two different Ubers, go back to my house. At this point, everyone's paired up. 
we have a little bit of a disaster in the bathroom with one of the girls. There's like these rubber balls flying around my house. There's people, I have a chalkboard wall, there's people drawing dicks on the chalkboard wall. And, yes, and, and obviously, that's the only choice. Um, and so then, we're all hanging out, partying, like everybody's having a good time, and Cowboy's just sitting on a bar stool, and you know, he's kind of, he's like a big guy, right? So he his legs aren't really together. I just walk right in between them, and started making out with him, like no regard for anyone else. It's my house, fuck you. So, right? So then that's where Sarah's like, okay, here's an about face, I'm gonna be the, the grown up. And uh, everybody, let's, let's go, okay. My hoe's gonna get it in, so we gotta go. And then I ended up having, I don't know, three couples stay the night at my house. Him and I had a great time. Um, and then that turned into thank you. I appreciate the applause. I mean, especially as Sarah mentioned, uh, states take me away rights. I'm just out here fucking at whoever. <laughs> Chunky little girl, my mom was stuffing my chunky little ass in a costume, and I was on stage like, look at me, I may be squeezing out of my costume, but I'm going to win you over on stage. Um, and it was funny because before I walked in here, I bumped into a high school classmate, and I was like, this is so crazy that we're in the same place at the same time, and she shared this story back in third grade when she moved to the city where I'm from, which is in the Shores. And she's like, do you remember like introducing me to everybody and being like a little brand ambassador, like this is so and so, like here's the year. And I'm like, wow, like I really had to trigger that memory. And sometimes it takes a person to remind you like who you are, because in life you tend to lose who you are. And that's been my entire life. And I've listened to a lot of people tonight, as you have, and they all have brought something to the stage that I'm like, fuck yeah! You know, or it's funny, or like Nicole said, like, dating in your 30s, good God, it is atrocious. If you are sitting with your significant other tonight, fuck them tonight, okay? <laughs> But uh, I, I think the topic tonight goes with every area of your life. About face, I wake up about face. It's an everyday challenge of changing my mind, of procrastination, of maybe not thinking I'm worthy enough, <coughs> not loving myself, and that's been the last eight years of my life. So I was in the radio broadcasting industry for a decade, and uh, it sucked the life out of me, which is so crazy because I thought like when I got into it, I was like, this is going to be amazing. 
I'm going to be this big radio personality. I'm going to be living in this big market. I'm going to have my own morning show, which I did get my own morning show in Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> You know, and so I thought I was like living life, but it slowly was sucking the life out of me. And I started to go on this quest, you know, back, and I lived in Vermont, like, I, I mean, I'm a wild child. I have been since I was a little girl. So I was always knowing that there was this call to live this big life, but I didn't know what it was. So I go off on this radio journey, and then I get in the middle of the fucking mountains. I just lost my dad in 2011. I finally get stillness, and I'm like, oh shit, this is scary. Like, I have to be alone with my own thoughts. I have to process life. I have to balance this radio show. I have to make new friends. I have to figure out how to really balance my checking account. And, you know, and, and thriving in a place, and your family bail on you, and then you're going through family shit. Then you date your boss. Because that's always good to, you know, mix business and pleasure. Um, turned out to be the most toxic relationship I'd ever been in in my life. Meanwhile, on social media, it just starts to bust down the scene, and you're like, okay, now I gotta be fake. You know? Now I gotta be perfect. And so all of it was leading up to Fort Wayne, Indiana, when I discovered loneliness. Loneliness is a son of a bitch. You know? You're like, wow, this, this hurts. Like, I can feel it in my, my heart center, and it's like, I think I'm having a heart attack, so I went to the hospital. I was like, I think I'm having a heart attack. They're like, no, it's anxiety. I was like, oh, okay, well, thousand dollars later, glad that, you know, was the answer. But it, it, was, <laughs> it was a reminder to me that I was losing a life that I thought was going to be a forever, you know? And, and I actually titled what I was talking about tonight that nobody told me about the space in the middle. You know, like you see someone that's like, oh, I'm unhappy with my job. What do I do? Do I stay here and let it suck the life out of me and retire to get that 401k? You know? Or do I look at this person who's this thriving entrepreneur, this thriving business, but nobody talks about this area when you're hanging by yourself and you're free falling. And you're like, uh, what do I do? And so if someone would have showed me snapshots in 2011, what my life was going to look like for the next eight years, I'd be like, yo, I'm going to stay at Maggiano's and wait tables, peace. <laughs> and I would, have never, I would have never gone on that journey because I was like, no. And so I had this, you know, I believe that we all have inner voices that talk to us, that take on other roles that people have pushed on us. And in my home, I was never really supposed to amount to anything, but yet I had my stage mom, like I just told her like a few weeks ago, because we've reconnected our uh, relationship. I said, you know, if you had the funds, you would have pinned me out like him. You know, like, you would have pinned me out like him, stage mom. And she was like, not gonna answer that question. <laughs> you know, and so I, life as I'm discovering, is a, is a journey, and I know that's like so overused and everybody uses it, but it's true. It's a journey of returning to yourself because people want to separate you from you. That's what's wrong with our world. That's why the world is so disconnected is because people don't know who the fuck they are. You know, so they don't, they don't love themselves, and they don't know who they are. How are they supposed to be in a relationship with you? How are you supposed to sit down and have an adult conversation? How are, you know, like everything starts to change in your life when you go on the quest of, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Episode one. You know, like, you would be trying to figure out, like, who the fuck am I? You know, like, I'm not this person. I don't hang out with these people anymore. I don't want to date men like this. I want to love myself. I want to get my finances better. I want to, nah, I'm not ready for family yet. You know, like, you go through the whole list of everything of who you are, and you're standing there basically, like, naked in the world, trying to find your place. And it's hard, and nobody talks about it, you know? So I discovered tools like journaling, and working out, and yoga, and meditation, and facing my shadows. Like, I had a lot of, a lot of shit to, to go through. And my inner critic, man, she's, she's awful. Like, you know, the days that, like, you don't want to do anything, you're like, no, bitch, get up, get up, you know? Like, go do something, go, go work towards your future. And like, it was said on stage, like, you have to live life for you. You're not gonna have someone kick your ass out of bed and be like, go to work, go to the gym, eat better, don't sleep with that guy, don't we sleep with that guy. You know, like, there's so many things that, you know, you, <laughs> I don't know, the repeats. 
Uh, yeah, so my other granny, she's a little bitch, and we go head to head, man. Like we're we're always head to head. Like I had to like as soon as I woke up this morning, it was like ding. Like I don't have kids, but if I did, I would imagine I open my eyes. They're like in your face, like ready, ready for tonight. Because you know she hasn't been on the stage, so I'm honoring her because that was her dream. And so as an adult, I found a way to get it out. But I, I think um, life is is a mystery. And it is our job to figure out who we are. And it's messy. You know, no one wants to, to deal with the messy middle. But imagine how you feel on the other side when you're living life for you. And you're not living for somebody else. You're not worried about keeping up with the Joneses. By the way, who the fuck are the Joneses? You know, I'm like, who are these people that the whole world is comparing their lives to? Like, I, I don't understand. But, um, so yeah, so that that's... That's kind of my, my story tonight. This is the first time I was up on stage in a really long time, so thank you for sharing space with me. And, uh, and even though I'm everybody else tonight, so but, um, I do, I do want to end with this. Self-love is your key to freedom. It's, it's your healing. It's the way to answer all those questions that you may have. It's the way to get into a healthy relationship, how to love yourself, but you have to face the shadows, and it's uncomfortable work, but nothing great happens inside your comfort zone. Thank you. Thank you. Our last storyteller is a writer, performer, he's a longtime member of the resident company here, and go come also one of the loves of my life. Give it up for Bob Wick. You heard weed's legal now. Yeah. You can smoke weed. Woo! You can do weed now. It's legal. <laughs> and I fucking hate it. Not because I'm religious or any of the other lame reasons why you shouldn't do weed. I suck at marijuana. I don't marijuana well. <laughs> I tried. I tried marijuana. Um, it did, we just don't fit together. I have to swing left on marijuana. <laughs> I tried, I tried several times because I know people who do marijuana well. And, and they're amazing. And, and these are uh, uh, poets and writers and comedians and painters and photographers. And they, they, they open up a, a part of their brain that is not unlocked when they're sober. And I'm, I, I, I believe that marijuana is the key, and I just don't know how to put it in the hole. <laughs> I tried, I tried. Uh, first time I tried marijuana, I was, uh, first time I tried weed, I was uh, 17 years old, I'm at a party. And and I had a cooler friend, you know, everybody has that friend who just, you know, even though we're 17, he's like 30. He's like, yeah. like, the, like the sage of fucking junior high, or juniors in high school. Uh, and he's like, Instructing us how to do it, and like this is this is the weed. So so I, I you know I've already mastered drinking because I had a Zima. Uh, and, and, and so I take a couple of puffs. I cough for what feels like an hour. Uh, my my lungs felt like I swallowed a bunch of nails, uh, rusty ones, and. And this voice pops in the back of my head that tells me that, hey Bob, convince someone at this party or stash you. <laughs> and I spent the whole night trying to convince people I'm a statue by walking up to them, standing still for a couple seconds, and saying, I'm a statue. <laughs> and the voice like, hey, I'm a statue. You convince one person, you win. I don't know what I win, but you win. Uh, and it's that thing like like she talked about, like you don't realize how stupid you're being until someone reminds you the next day and you do like that replay reel and you're like, oh yeah, that was that was weird. So I did marijuana for a while. <laughs> and then I got older and, and I met you know, I, I started working at Go and I met other people who who marijuana well and I'm like, I, these are my friends, and if they can marijuana, I can marijuana. So one night I met at, at 
uh, good friends of mine at the house, and they, they made edibles, and they, they're a married couple, and we're having fun, we're watching videos, we're watching old, like, SNL and stuff, and I eat the marijuana because, hey, at least this time my lungs ain't gonna hurt. And, and I fall asleep after eating a full, you know those uh, fruit trays and, and, and a veggie tray from, from Meyer. Uh, I ate that shit like Scooby Doo. And it was gone. And then I just fell asleep on your couch. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, everybody else was sleeping. And hey, Bob, you're melting into the couch. So I jump on the couch because that, you don't want to melt into a couch. And then also, you ate too much fiber. And your stomach is gonna explode. And I'm freaking out, like, do I wake up Jen and Ted to tell them that my, my stomach is gonna explode in the middle of their living room? Because I don't want to be that guy. Like, I like to be a, a good party guest. I feel like, but then again, I don't, but I don't want to be the guy standing over your bed, like, wake up. I ate too much fiber. <laughs> so, so there was, there was another voice that was so messy. All you need to do is burp. So, like, Charlie and his weird ass grandpa, I go into their fridge, chuck a two liter, and burp like, oh, okay, all the gas is out. You can go to bed now. Again, not very longing at all well. So I, I, I take a break, I take a break. Uh, then last, like two years ago, uh, I was laid off temporarily. Um, so I was like, hey, you know what people do when they don't have a job? They marijuana. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking do this. I'm gonna, this is my, my white marijuana whale. I'm gonna fucking throw and take this motherfucker. Uh, so I, I go to our trusted drug dealer because he's a good dude. And I'm like, how do I want marijuana? He's like, oh, you want marijuana? I'm like, yes, I would like marijuana. Uh, so I, I know I like edibles because they don't make my lungs hurt. I'm like, oh my god, I got some marijuana for you. And he gets me, and he gets me because for some reason I've discovered if you know marijuana well, people who do marijuana well like they give you marijuana just to, for their own happiness, I guess. And it's like, they get the story. Uh, so he gives me this, it's like a Hershey bar. And you know how like a Hershey bar is divided into like little things. He's like, just, you know, at first, take a, take, take a uh, rectangle and then like just nibble on it. Right? Okay, I'm fat. Dude. I see a fucking candy bar. I want to fucking eat this stuff. But you know how to marijuana. So I'm marijuana right. So for a couple of weeks, I, I did marijuana right. And it was nice. It was a cool buzz. And Seinfeld was funny. And I, I loved it. <laughs> So I thought, when I had this down, I was like, fuck yes, I'm marijuana like a motherfucker. Uh, give me all of it, give me an IV of marijuana, because I'm crushing this. Uh, so I meet up with some friends one night, and we're drinking, and what we're catching up is me and an old roommate, and a female friend of mine. Uh, I don't do names, so, okay. Uh, we decide, like, you know, Drinking's fun, but why don't we go back to my house, have a couple more drinks, have some marijuana, and then go see a movie, because I hear that's what people do when they're on marijuana. And I know how to marijuana now. So we do that. Uh, the agreement was, they buy the tickets to go see uh, Kong's King Island, or whatever. I don't do names. Uh, Skull Island, my bad. Uh, we go to Kong's Skull Island, and I'll get the Uber. Cool. So we, we go out to uh, Birmingham, and we go to the theater, and, uh, oh, I decided that night I was going to have a little extra, because I needed more of a kick if I was going to watch a movie. <laughs> we get in there, everything's fine. Uh, then we decide to split up. I was going to get concessions, they were going to get seats, uh, and then it hit me. I'm in line like, everybody knows I've been marijuana. Everybody can see that I'm fucking high. Just be cool, man. Just be cool. So I, so I order order my popcorn, and they both want drinks. Oh shit! I'm gonna carry two drinks and popcorn. <laughs> it's okay, man. You're super so Applebee's. You can you can you can serve your hands. You can fucking do this. Come on, man. Chill 
smile. People know you're high. <laughs> you don't want that to happen because then you're not marijuana correctly. <laughs> so I figure out the drinks, which takes a tray, and, and, and a popcorn, which is under the arm. And I walk down the aisle way, they were walking down, and I like, it's, it's an older theater, so it doesn't have like the marquee where it's like, uh, this is what movie's playing here. It's just, it's numbers. I'm like, well, they bought the ticket, so I don't know what number. So I'm just walking it, and, and, and it sets me off. Like, I don't know something. Oh, your marijuana ain't wrong. <laughs> and everybody knows it. It's high school. Why are you convince someone to a statue? Like, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, so I pop in the first theater, there's a movie going on. All right, that's not mine. I go into another theater, the, the, something's going on, and I, uh, like the, the previews, and I look up and I don't see my friends, and I'm freaking out like, oh, everybody in this theater knows I'm high. <laughs> and I go into the third one, they're there, everything's cool, and I melt into the chair. And if you ever would have asked me the next day what uh, Kong Skull Island was about, it's about an animated uh, Mark Evans uh, flying. Uh, he's big, but the, 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 the plane's small, and he's taking on oh, a plastic monkey. Uh, yeah. I don't marijuana well. Uh, so, halfway through it, I'm like, everybody knows I'm high and I gotta pee. And I get up and I'm like, oh man, stairs are a thing. And I get down there and I pee. And when I get out of the restroom, I realize I don't remember what. <laughs> oh, I'm not doing this again. I'm not going through another theater because the movie's already going, so I won't be able to narrow it down like I did last time. Oh, I'm so fucked. <laughs> and I'm freaking out. And the boys in my head, like, everybody knows you're high. The cops are coming. So I'm like, I'm getting out of here. So. Uh, I didn't realize this at the time, but the only way to get out was going down the stairs because apparently, uh, later on I found out, like, the theater's on the third floor. Uh, so, uh, so they direct me to the stairs, I start walking down the stairs. I start walking down the stairs. I start walking down the stairs. I'm walking down the stairs. <laughs> and I feel like I've been walking down too many stairs. And the voice in my head goes, you're walking to hell. <laughs> and I and I and I honestly have this thought, you had a heart attack, your body's upstairs, but you're in limbo now. And your <laughs> limbo is you walking down this same place of stairs over and over again. You should learn how to marijuana. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you.